One of the great aspects behind the fascination of dinosaurs are the nearly limitless amount of unknowns. Now to a paleontologist, these unknowns are both fascinating and perplexing. Now it's commonly accepted that dinosaurs died out over 65 million years ago. But what does the evidence actually tell us? What is the process in which these fossils are excavated so that they can be studied? And is there any evidence that supports a global catastrophic flood only a few thousand years ago? Paleontologists have searched the entire world looking for those answers. And sometimes they come to Wyoming where we are today, because today we're going to dig up a dinosaur on Dino Hunter. It's known worldwide, the Hell Creek Formation in Montana and the Upper Cretaceous Lance Formation in Wyoming contain some of the largest T-Rex fossils ever found. This includes the dinosaur fossils found by Mary Schweitzer and Dr. Jack Horner, some of which contain soft tissue. But these formations are also rich in many other types of dinosaur fossils, such as Triceratops and Edmontosaurus. Every spring, one of the largest dig sites in the world opens up during the month of June. It's known as the Dinosaur Research Project at the Hansen Research Station near Newcastle, Wyoming. It's operated under invitation by Southwestern Adventist University under the leadership of paleontologist Dr. Art Chadwick. Over the last 20 years, tens of thousands of fossils, which include many dinosaur remains, have been dug out of the ground by teams working a total of 21 quarries. How did you get involved in all of this? I came out here at the request of a friend who was a paleontologist and he took me up on the ridge over this way and I got out of the truck and I couldn't stand on the ground without walking on dinosaur bones. And that really hurt me because I realized <laughs> we aren't making dinosaurs anymore. So these bones, <laughs> when they're washed away, they're gone forever. Yeah. So we're losing data every day. And even though I was working on another project down in Peru at the time, I said, I have to spend time on this project. I have to try to save this data for future generations. So that's how I got started. Under the direction of Dr. Chadwick, they have developed some of the best high-tech methods in the world for logging, mapping, and documenting dinosaur graveyards. Why are you going into such detail with all of your documentation and all of your research? Well, we really were stimulated to do good work here because a secular paleontologist had been on site prior to us being here, and he had challenged the ranch owner, he said, this is the last day science is going to be done on, on this ranch. And the ranch owner said, well, no, we're going to find some Christian paleontologists who can come out here and do, this, do, do good work. So after we had worked here for a season or two, we decided that the normal way of doing this is not good enough for us. Okay. And one of uh, our team is a geophysicist, astrophysicist, and he suggested using GPS. So we went back and started finding ways to get a hold of a high resolution GPS, which is what they use for surveying. And it's accurate to centimeter yeah. or less. In 2000, we started mapping bones using the GPS. So we can take a series of points along the bone. Those are accurate to within a centimeter. And that gives us a way to register that bone on the computer exactly where it was found in the ground. So we take a picture of the bone, we register it with those points using the geographical information system software, 
and then that stays there and all the other bones can accrue around it. So we can reconstruct the quarry just the way it looks without the dirt. And so we do a lot of research just looking at the distribution of these bones without ever being out in the field. And we can do that because we have this high resolution data. Dr. Chadwick's research team logs each piece, repairs any damaged pieces, then takes many photos of the bone. After these photos are taken, they are put into software and a 360 degree view is provided of each specimen on the university's website. Their methods are known and respected by paleontologists around the world. Over the years, the ranch has produced an extensive accumulation of fossil remains, totaling more than 10,000 creatures, including 12 genera of dinosaurs, 10 genera of non-dinosaurian reptiles, 7 genera of fish, 5 genera of mammals, as well as mollusks and even dinosaur eggshells. The most numerous fossils at the site are the bones of Edmontosaurus, a duck-billed dinosaur growing up to a length of 30 to 40 feet. They were an herbivore who may have lived in water or swamp-like environments. The remains of Triceratops are fairly common, along with Tyrannosaurus, Pachycephalosaurus, and Dromaeosaurus. It's also the location where one of the first Nanotyrannus was ever found. The Nano is believed to be the smaller cousin of the T-Rex. Now at this dig site right here, is there a, an overarching goal as far as like what you're gonna do with the fossils and all of the data that you're collecting here? What do you say is the mission statement of this dig? We are here to find out what we can learn about the dinosaurs from the bones. In other words, they don't talk, but they tell us things without speaking. They tell us things about what happened to them. And we're trying to decipher that. And it's very exciting. It's like crime scene investigation. Yeah. You're, you're reconstructing the history of the animals from these bones. It's like Sherlock Holmes deducing all the little elements, the little sciences of it. Exactly. Time for breakfast. Let's go get some food. All right, I just had breakfast, fueled up and ready to go, and we're wasting daylight, so let's get to work. I've been told that there's several different dig sites here, and I'm not sure which one is the best, so I'm gonna go to them all, because we gotta find a dinosaur. There are a total of 21 quarries at the Hanson Ranch, but only four in operation during the week I'm here. The first three are close together, but the fourth is several miles away by a truck using only four-wheel drive. To take advantage of my time, I'm sticking to the first three. This is North Quarry, and I'm meeting up with Erin. She's the lady in charge who's gonna give us the grand tour of our first location. Hi. Hi there. How's it going? Good. All right. So, my first question, what exactly are we doing here? <laughs> um, well, I've got my team here. This is North Quarry. McKinnon is taking down this wall here um, a layer at a time. So he creates a shelf and then he brings the whole shelf down, exposing the fossils. You can see some of the fossils that he's exposed here. So this is um, oh my gosh. part of an, um, a vertebra. Here. Nice. The, um, the round part of the vertebra would have gone uh, right about here, like this. And then this is uh, this would go up. Got it. There's also something coming right over here, right? Yeah, uh, this looks like it's a bone right next to a tendon. And I don't know if they're supposed to go together or not, but I'm really hoping that they do because that would be really neat to find these two uh, body parts together in the correct context. Oh yeah. yeah. How long do you usually stay at one location? Uh, well, <laughs> this quarry has been open since the dig began, and uh, this wall actually started way back there. 
um, and so we've moved it all the way up uh, season by season. Uh, so you can see more or less the wall is pretty straight. We try to keep everybody going about the same pace in this direction. That's helpful when you're digging next to somebody and you find a fossil that goes over goes where they're their digging. Area, yeah. It would be helpful if you're working at about the same rate so that you get to it around the same time. How many fossils have you found at this site? For this season, we've probably already found uh, over a hundred. That includes everything all the way from a tooth all the way up to larger bones like ribs, um, large toe bones. So what kinds of dinosaurs have you found at this location? Predominantly we find fossils from Hadrosaur. We've also found the teeth from Nanotyrannus and occasionally you find Triceratops. As I'm looking at this wall, my first question is, how do you know what is bone and what is rock? Um, that comes with a lot of experience. <laughs> you can see that the bones have this distinctive look to them. They're, they're this characteristic brown color usually, and they're very smooth. And they make a certain noise when you hit them with a dig tool, and you learn to recognize it as you You just digging. kind of experience <laughs> the rock as you're going through it. Something like that. All right, now, these are some big bones. Yeah, so you can see there are a lot of bones exposed on this wall. And we've actually done something special here. We took down this whole section and we've exposed all the bones so that you can see how they would appear in the ground. And we actually cast this entire wall uh, in a latex mold, removed it, we're taking it back to the museum where we'll make a plaster model of how the quarry actually looks. So you can with the actually bones see what the bones would look like in the ground. That's right. And so visitors to the museum will be able to interact with this wall and get an idea of where bones would be in our in a real quarry. Wow. And you were saying that the bigger bones are settling lower. So you yes. can see down at the bottom, those are definitely much bigger bones. It's not like a, a full skeleton though. That's right. The bones that we find in these quarries are not articulated, which means they're not together the way a complete skeleton would be. You'll find them separated from each other, largest bones on the bottom of the bed, and you'll find smaller bones and fragments up here, uh, teeth distributed at the top. Got it. Um, so it's, it's a graded bone bed. And where you see the larger bones there on the bottom, um, that is the bottom of the bone layer. So if you keep going further, uh, you'll find below that um, what we call a non-fossil bearing stratus. So there are no more fossils below it. It's a different kind of sediment. Okay. I think uh, I'm gonna go look at a few more dig sites. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking me through your, uh, your quarry here. No problem. All right, moving on. With great fossils being found here at the ranch, it would seem one month a year isn't very long. After all, more time could yield even greater fossils, right? If we dug for two months, we'd get twice as many bones out. And I determined when I first started this project, I was not going to just store these bones down in the basement of the football stadium, which is what a lot of paleontologists do. And, and if you go to the Smithsonian, there are acres of, of bones just that were- bag it and tag it. Yeah, yeah, it's collected, but it's not processed. And so I wanted to process all our bones, and I have trouble keeping up with the 1,000 or 1,500 that we get every year. If I worked longer, we'd have more bones, and it would be more difficult for us to keep up with them. So it's not a feasible uh, thing to do for us. How do you go to an area and say, I think there's fossils here, we should dig here? We can't use ground penetrating radar here because it's all clay, and, and ground penetrating radar works in sandstones. We haven't even tried to exploit it. The, in fact, the rental agency wouldn't rent me the equipment because okay. they said, you can't, it won't work. It just won't work. So we have people that just spread out over the countryside and go looking for places where bones are eroding out. And then we'll analyze it and see if it's something that we want to explore. Mainly what we're trying to understand in this big bone bed that we're in right here is what does it look like? What are its boundaries and how extensive is it? And what happens at the boundaries? Does it suddenly stop? and drop everything out or does it tail off and which direction were they moving and so those kinds of questions are part of the big picture of what we're trying to find here. The really great thing about hunting fossils here is that anyone can do it. You don't have to be a world-class paleontologist. When you arrive they train you on the proper protocol for digging and how to properly log what you find. 
After the training, you're ready to work side by side with experts and beginners. After all, who doesn't love the excitement of finding a dinosaur? This is our next dig site. This is Southeast Quarry, and I'm meeting up with Whitney because already I can tell there's something very special about this site. Whitney. Hey. How's it going? Good, how are you? Okay, so the first thing that I've noticed mm -hmm. is that there are kids digging up fossils right now. Mm -hmm. How is this possible? Well, I think this site is actually pretty cool. This is the only place that I know of where they can actually let kids come in and do this. We have a crew of like 30 people here. We actually have so many bones, not like if something were to happen to one, that it would be as devastating as if, you know, some places where there's less. And you can already see what they've dug up. I mean, they're digging up fossils right now. Mm -hmm. What are you digging up over there? Well, that's what you started um, yesterday. Okay. And so I ended up just like finishing it up. Looks very good. I'm gonna take a peek right over here and see what this guy's working Alrighty. on. Alrighty. What are you working on, big guy? Well, at the moment, we don't know. Okay. I haven't revealed enough of it. It looks like it may bend right here, or it may continue going into the mountain area. How long have you been working on this? Uh, I've been working on this since yesterday. Started to dig down to it. Then once I find it, start working around it and figure out where it goes. And you got a brush and a pick, and you're just slowly chipping away. Trying to find out what's down here. All right. All right, Whitney, what exactly are we looking at right here? So it looks like these may be hip bones. It looks like it was a semi-articulated hadrosaur. It's partially put together, but you can see like there's a lot of scattering going on. It looks like those are ribs over here, that these are hips. Yeah, just a bunch of different yep. bones. <laughs> Kind yep. of scattered. And you said it's a hadrosaur? Uh, yes. It may have walked on its hind legs or on its front. We don't really even know. Whichever museum you go to may be mounted differently. Yeah. So there's still a lot to learn about these. How do you know what bones you're looking at? This is my first time. So we have a manual that will show you the different kinds of bones what generally will look like. Wait, so this is your first time? Yes, this is my first time here. I've been here since Tuesday evening and it is Friday. Okay. So yeah. Wow, new. it seems like you've picked up a lot in a very short amount of time. Yes, this is a good place to learn. One of the problems we run into, obviously, is that they're not always put together well. Yeah. So seeing as they may be, you know, partial and fragmented, it's it's hard to tell what you're looking at sometimes. You know, you'll find something where a whole, whole half of it is missing. So some of these people can just say, I know what that is, and other people are, found a bone. <laughs> now, when, when you get into a, a, a situation like this where you've got bones just tangled into each other what's the game plan like what's the objective like are you just trying to unearth one good full bone or are you trying to show exactly what's buried here oh we have to gps everything in order to know what position everything was laying in and then we can remove it so it's okay to take it apart as long as we know everything was originally it's hard to do that sometimes with some of the fragmented bones because they actually come out with some of the dirt and you don't know that they were there. Yeah. But I think the main game plan would just be to be careful not to like break anything apart as you're, as you're going down. You run from the top, so you want to dig from the top of these sediments down because a lot of the bones run into the dirt this way, so you can't get them out unless you go from top to bottom, which is a good strategy because it makes it easy to see what you find as it's going down in GPS layer by layer. What we're looking at is fossilized bone, so it's very rock-like. How easy is it to just crack and shatter? I mean, it, it, it they so look easy. like rocks to me. They look like rocks, but they're nothing like rocks. Um, I think that was one of the misconceptions I had coming here. Visually, they're more easy to tell apart, but sometimes, you know, there's a lot of sticks that are imprinted that look like fossils and then they're not fossils. Or are you just digging in the dirt and the fossils come out with the dirt, so they shatter. We have to glue them as we go. If you like, if you glue see them. one, yes, we use super glue, like super glue. little super glue, okay. <laughs> the little tubes of super glue. <laughs> and as you brush it away, you'll see they're just cracked everywhere, and they just flake apart. So you okay. have to you have to glue it glue together. Glue them back to, together. Mm -hmm. What is super glue not good for? Um, your oh. fingers. <laughs> wow. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Whitney. Yeah, no um, problem. My pleasure. I'm gonna go dig through some more pits. All right. Well, you have fun. All right. We'll do. Thanks. Most people would say that science should be unbiased and objective. But we're humans, 
and when we are honest with ourselves, we have to admit our bias. Often our worldviews or bias play into our belief about what happened in the past. These become our presuppositions, our starting points. A naturalist believes that only natural processes can be used to understand the world and deny any supernatural causes. They would never consider a creator god or the biblical global flood. Therefore, they would interpret all evidence in a way that confirms their belief that only nature exists. Naturalistic evolutionists believe that dinosaur bones were buried in mud and sand over millions of years in small regional floods. They totally ignore the idea of a global flood. So how can we be sure of what happened in the past? Could it be that dinosaurs buried here give us some clues and how they died? I hope that, that the secular paleontologists are open-minded and willing to go where the data lead. But we certainly are. We're trying to understand the history of these bones. Given that we have insight into the history of the world from the Bible, we still are trying to understand what the bones tell us and whether they're consistent with that or not. We have been uh, able to decipher some of this data enough to say that this is deposited rapidly, catastrophically, if you will, because these bones are in a graded bed. The big bones are down at the bottom and the smaller bones are at the top. That means it was a single catastrophic debris flow that put these bones in here. So that's something we learned because we were looking open-minded. Subsequently, other paleontologists who had not thought of that as a possibility have told me that, oh yeah, our, our bones are in that same distribution. Yeah. They show that same distribution, but they hadn't thought of it as unique or, or important at, at the time. But because we were open-minded and just looking to see what the bones said, we fell into that and it became an important part of the story that we have to uncover here. So how important is it for you to follow the data? Well, if you're going to be a scientist, that's what you should be doing. I know not all scientists do that. There's this idea that the reigning paradigm, you don't really think beyond what other people are thinking. And it tends to make science very easy because you don't have to do any extra work. You already know where it all fits. But we decided that we would go with Chamberlain's idea, a geologist, who suggested that we need to generate as many hypotheses as possible to explain any particular phenomenon. And then once we have all those hypotheses, we should try to eliminate the ones that don't work. And that leaves us with a better idea, uh, gives us a chance to make breakthroughs in science. And that's what we've done. The last site I want to visit is a bit of a walk from the first two sites. So they let me borrow some fun transportation. All right, this is our third site. This is Stair Quarry. And I'm here to meet Keith, the man with the PhD who's gonna give me the rundown. Hey there. How's it Morning. going? Morning. All right, so this is stair quarry? Stair quarry. Okay, so what exactly am I looking at here? Well, if you look around this area, initially they found a few uh, bones clear off on the edge over here. Uh, a couple of those bones were very important from a Mano Tyrannosaurus. There are about four of these creatures that have been found in the world. Oh wow, so this is a big find. A big find. Most of this ranch has the mix of bones as they've been moved in and just jumbled. Okay. This was from the same individual. Now what else have you found, uh, like in this area over here? Well, in the same, in the same area, there's a single hadrosaur. You've seen the main bones uh, over there. Large vertebrae, probably 35, 40 feet, six, seven ton creature. Okay. So we're finding pieces of that creature here also. In these last couple years, we haven't worked here. We said we're gonna give it a last try and see if we can find any more nano bones or not. Okay, now how much farther will you go into this hillside before you say, let's pull the plug and... An hour and a half. An hour and a half, so this is the last <laughs> final push. This is the last push. For the We're stair quarry. Clean to the edge here. Now there's something over here that caught my eye and I've got some questions for you, so let's move over here real quick. So this is one of the bones that you found here? Yeah, a small vertebrae. As you can see, it doesn't look very pretty. 
some smooth edges here, which is fairly good. The bottom's poor. This has been powder, we've glued it. Kind of powder up here, we've glued it. We still have to identify it, GPS it, mark it, but that's all we've found in this whole area. In this whole thing. And as I'm looking up here, the, the thing that catches my eye is this all looks the same to me. How, yeah. how do you dig through this and say, oh, that's a bone and this is rock? Because as I'm looking at this, this would have blended in with that very easily. That's why we're using the shovels and they're not. Okay. Uh, we've had about eight years of experience working on this stuff. So as we're shoveling, we take the shovels and go through the stuff, we can hear and feel if we're hitting a bone. So you just got that finely you feel tuned it and touch. It, oh, stop. And then we work on it from there. How many bones have you dug up? I've probably had a couple thousand. A couple thousand? <laughs> yeah, maybe not that many. We had a lot of little teeth. Probably our, our group has been about 5,000, so maybe 1,000. Okay. I don't really keep track. The thing is, I just happen to be lucky and get the areas which have a lot of little bones so I get to count all those. What's the coolest uh, fossil that you've dug up? Probably last year was our best. We were over in Triceratops and we uh, ran across approximately 110 bones of a single creature, a small Thessalosaurus, and we got all those bones out, but it's the first real complete creature we found on the ranch. All right, well, thank you so much. Appreciate you showing me around. Right, I, think I, uh, I think I know what site I'm gonna dig at. Not here. No, not here. I'm gonna go, <laughs> I'm gonna go find some bones. Good. All right, we'll see you in a little Enjoy. bit. When we visit dinosaur museums, read books, or see photos, we are often presented with a full dinosaur skeleton. But more often than not, they are not buried as complete connected skeletons. They are often scattered about in a quarry and put together from multiple specimens. This style of burial also gives us clues on how they died. Why aren't we finding skeletons and full creatures, you know, posing? What? How did that happen? In this particular bone bed, it's clear that these animals died sometime before they were buried. It could have been days, weeks, months before they were finally brought in here and buried. And during that time, they had the occasion to rot. I'm sure that it was not a pleasant place to be around because here you have thousands of animals, each 30, 40 feet long, and they're all rotting. And while they were rotting, there were tyrannosaurids and other uh, carnivorous dinosaurs were actually consuming the carcasses. And that went on for some period of time. And then... The kind of like sca scavenging. Scavenging, yeah. yeah. And then the whole thing was remobilized and taken out into deeper water and buried in this graded bed. Now we know those carnivores were active because we find their shed teeth in amongst the, the fossils. Have you found any examples here of multiple bones being in one location? There are two kinds of dinosaurs you find generally. One is disarticulated masses of bones like we have here. The other is you find whole skeletons or partial skeletons at another locality, one of our quarry sites that's active right now. They are finding whole carcasses or partially articulated skeletons. All of them are missing parts, which means there was some time between when they died and when they were buried. I think this is also evidence of catastrophism because if you find a whole skeleton buried, that had to be buried fast. Yeah. And these bones had to be buried fast because of the nature of the sedimentology. You just can't find evidence for slow burial. Either you lose them, they get weather beaten, and if you don't bury them quickly, they're, they're gonna be gone. The fact that we have these dinosaur bones is an indication of rapid burial. I've been to a handful of sites now and I think I'm getting an idea of what is happening here. So, the next item on the agenda, I'm gonna learn how to dig for fossils. All right, Erin, I'm back. Okay. So, before I mess anything up, I'm just gonna lean myself to your expertise uh, and teach me your ways. So, we've already taken this shelf down and you can see it's pretty level. Um, and so we have this corner that's up a little bit higher than the rest and we want to bring it all down to this level and we might find something on the way down. So we're going to use our scraper and um, we just take off a layer at a time and 
just paying attention. We want to be able to uh, work carefully when we find it. What are some indicators that I've reached a fossil? Well, you'll hear a noise and it sounds kind of like you've run into glass and it just kind of sounds like clink. Okay. <laughs> And it feels different than the rock, and it doesn't, it doesn't yield easily to the scraper. You'll probably recognize that you've run into something. Um, and you want to keep the area clear uh, so that you can see what's going on. Eventually, when we get a pile here, we just put it in the dustpan and move it to a bucket. Let's say I, I bump into a fossil. Obviously, I'm going to stop and call for you, but uh, what would the process look like from that point forward? Okay, so once you run into something, you're gonna to wanna to switch to a finer, finer tool. The scraper isn't gonna be a lot of help to you anymore. So you'll switch to something like a pick, and then you would carefully work the dirt around it. Now, once you can see a good portion of, of the fossil, uh, then you would want to add some glue to that. So you would take your glue and you would carefully drop a few drops on it, and then you would continue to expose it using a fine tool like a pick, or you could get an even finer tool um, if you needed to work more carefully. Um, and actually, a lot of the fine, finer tools that we use are uh, donated dental picks and things like that. Okay. So we can get Tooth really picks. fine with, yeah, with removing the sediment from around it. And you'll always want to use your brush to keep the area clear so you can really see what you're working with and also so that you don't glue extra dirt to the bone. Um, now they'll take care of those things in the lab, but we want to send them a fossil in the best shape that we can. Okay, so I'm going to try this now. And if I hit something slightly harder, just be ready because I'm going to be hollering like crazy, okay? <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. Digging for fossils. Well, I've been digging for a while now and I haven't really found anything yet, but it's pretty nerve wracking to be shoving this piece of steel down in the dirt because I think that at any second I'm just going to shove it right through a bone. But I've been told that I will know the difference between the dirt and the bone. So just going to keep going. Oh, oh, oh. So I've been kind of shoving this thing in here a little bit and it sounds different. It sounds a little bit harder. So I think, I think I may have found a fossil. This is the part where it gets very meticulous. You're just kind of chunking away little bits of, of soil, hoping that you can dig around the bone, but it's, it's kind of nerve wracking. You uh, want to get the dirt, nothing else. I don't, I don't know if this is actually a fossil. I think it's just hard dirt. Well, it looks like it's a false alarm. I thought I hit a fossil, but the more I dig down, I realize it's just hard dirt. Uh, it's a little embarrassing, but you know what? No risk, no reward. Back to digging. One of the challenges at the quarries is a strong wind picking up in the afternoons. It pushes sand and dust across the landscape. Dust blows into the dig site and down into the work areas. Crews have to be diligent to make sure the areas stay covered. All right, now hold the phone. Hold the phone. So just a few inches from where I thought I saw a bone, I actually found a bone. I uh, was just kind of scraping into it and I heard, you can hear it. It's like a, a sharp, almost like a sharp but hollow sound. And uh, so I just stopped down and I've got this little, you know, toothpick here and I'm just scraping little bits of dirt, but you can, you can actually see it and you can hear it. So, <laughs> I just found a fossil. Now, I'm not a bone expert, but looking at the top of this guy right here, it looks eerily similar to this guy over here. This is the skull fragment from earlier. So, maybe this is actually a part of this. We'll see. I'm definitely starting to get into some fossils over here. So now we're down to the nitty gritty. It's time to throw on some glasses. We're gonna dig this down, maybe find some more bones. Here we go.
Uh, I think I just found another one. All right, so we've got two different bones that we're working on here. This guy right here, it's a little guy. I'm gonna start digging some of the loose soil around it with my fancy toothpick here. And then uh, we'll come back up here, try and dig around this guy too. Okay, so I have the bones uh, completely unearthed. All the corners are, are exposed and you can actually kind of pick them up and move them. So I don't, I don't wanna do too much there. What's the next step in the process from here? Okay, so now we need to start documenting these finds. The first step will be uh, for you to document in this notebook um, by sketching <laughs> what you found. And you can follow the sequence that I have here. Um, so you'll see that I have a find number here. You can go to the next number, which is nine. And uh, this is the number that'll stay with your bone forever. <laughs> and I have to get you a card for that. Okay. And then here's the other information, description, which quarry you're in, and what type of sediment this is. So this is shaley mudstone, so you'll include okay. that. Um, so here's the tape measure, so you can take some measurements, and I'll let you work on entering that information while I get you a card. <laughs> okay, <laughs> do my best to not completely botch this drawing here. Okay, so wow, she's, she's really good at this. Number nine. So this is a skull bone fragment. Now, let's measure this guy. Okay, so I've got a very bad rough sketch of my skull bone fragment. I've got both measurements. Uh, I've got the number of bone that we found today. It's a skull bone fragment, which is pretty cool. North Quarry and we are digging in shaley mudstone. So now, last but not least, I'm gonna get a card and tag this bone because I dug it up and it's gonna have my name on it and it's gonna have its permanent number for the rest of its life. So here's your card. There's a place here for excavator, that's you. That's me. So you'll fill that in. <laughs> so this card has the number that will track your bone all the way back to the museum and into the um, collections. All right, so, can you read that? Yes. Okay. So um, you'll write the date of your find. All right, now do I leave this here? <laughs> yes, so once you get your card ready, we keep it with the fossil and we'll call for GPS and they'll come and take the points and photograph your find. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and put that right there so it doesn't blow away. Give you your logbook back. All right. Thank you so much. I just dug up a skull bone. All right, good job. Thanks, appreciate it. <laughs> so Aaron's got the GPS. Apparently this is gonna take a little bit of teamwork, especially with some of the wind whipping around. Um, what do we do here? I'm going to support the top and you'll guide the tip at the bottom. All right, you can move to the next point. All right. So what I'm doing at the top is I'm leveling it to make sure that the top is directly above the bottom. Perfect. And I think this will be the final point. Okay. How's that? All right, so we got our points. Now we'll actually use the same instrument to take a photo of the fossil and it'll automatically attach it to the points that we just took. Okay, so set your card right next to the fossil and make sure we can see all the information on the card. Okay. All right, so now you're ready to wrap up your fossil and send it back to the museum. All right, so here's the foil all right. and here's so the just, stickers. Is, it, is there like a process here? Do I just gently wrap it in the tin foil? Right, so you can set the tin foil down and you can put the card underneath this like okay. that. Uh, and now you need one sticker on the inside. So here's your number, 835. And then you wrap it up nicely. <laughs> How nicely? Like, like leftovers from dinner nicely or? Just so nothing falls out. Okay. Okay. And, and then here. one more sticker here. This one for the outside. And we're ready to send it back. Yeah! 
That's the whole process. I just dug yeah. up a fossil. <laughs> it's on the record. All right. The fact that we can dig through the earth and find fossils is amazing. Discovering how they got there, that's the mystery. Scientists are adamantly trying to discover the truth that lies buried with these bones. But what is the data telling us? Dr. Chadwick's research lends itself to a global catastrophic event. More specifically, the global flood. The information's out there. What do you think?